The aims of uh, this afternoon are to provide an overview of the ACT code, uh, particularly for our, our social service colleagues, um, to promote local partnerships between social services, education and health. Um, we're going to provide you with some information about further education institutes, colleges and the role that they play and, and uh, the work that they do. My colleague Joe Baldwin from Bridge End College has very kindly agreed uh, to present on that. He'll be following my presentation and then uh, following that um, Kirsten Jones, the policy um, policy lead for NatSpec Wales uh, will give a short presentation on the role of specialist colleges. Uh, thanks to Kirsten again for joining us today for that as well. So again, a reminder, um, keep yourselves on mute. If you're if the chat pane doesn't work for you uh, and you wish to ask a question, then obviously unmute and ask the question. And we'll uh, ha Hannah will be uh, listening out for those and we'll make a note of questions uh, as they come through. Um, and a uh, final reminder, again, we are being recorded, so just be aware of that as we're going on and that recording will be available later. OK, so I'm going to make a start. Um, bear with me a minute. Uh, sorry. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so we're going to start with um, kind of why we're here, the importance of this, um, this, this uh, uh, this event for everybody and it's really around this importance of partnerships and if anybody's wondering whatever happened to uh, to partnerships one some of you will have attended our, a session that we did in november uh, which was partnerships uh, post 16 partnerships one um, unfortunately we couldn't think of a, a, a new name so we just went with uh, post 16 partnerships two for this one um, the, the previous one that we did have some attendance from uh, our social service colleagues, but not a great deal. So that's one of the reasons we put this event on. Uh, the aim here is to try to uh, make it really clear how the act and code if, will affect young people and therefore how we need to be working in partnership with our, our social services colleagues, health colleagues, education colleagues, in order to make sure that we uh, meet all of young people's needs uh, and we do that in an appropriate way. Um, it's also to give you an overview of the, the, the code and the act um, and, uh, you know, why we why that why that code talks about working collaboratively, because there's an awful lot in the code about that. Uh, it talks uh, relates to the, uh, the the well-being of future generations act and the importance of sustainable development and principles around that. Um, obviously, around efficiency, we need to try to the, the better we work together, the more efficient we can be. Um, but we can also make sure that we're doing a proper job of meeting young people's needs, listening to them properly from all aspects of their needs and making sure that uh, provision is there to meet those needs post 16. Um, and a reminder that uh, there, there will come in the, over the next few years, a couple of years, there will be a delegation of what is currently held by Welsh Government specialist funding. Um, that is used currently by Welsh Government to provide uh, placements for young people in, in specialist colleges, uh, which will now be known as ISPEs. Um, and that is being delegated to local authorities over the next couple of years. It's not being delegated to uh, to education departments, to inclusion departments. It's being delegated to local authorities. And, the per and the, there's a good reason why um, Welsh Government are doing that is because they recognise that this is um, a partnership. This has to be a partnership between uh, both sides of local authorities, both the social care and the education side. And it's really important those sides are working together to make sure we're meeting the needs of, of young people post 16. So we know what now why we're here, why we're, we're talking this way. Uh, I'm going to give you a, just an overview, really, uh, of, of the Act, a few points of the Act. I'm not going to be able to go into detail today. Uh, we don't have the time for that, but uh, I, I want to give you uh, the kind of headlines, really, around the Act and the Code. So something around the aims uh, right from the beginning. This is the whole of the development uh, transformation work that we've been doing has been set around uh, 11 aims or principles of the Act. And if we start with high aspirations, the, the purpose, uh, part of the purpose is to try to make sure that we keep real, really high aspirations for our young people. Colleges are working on that, have been working on that for some time. Um, one of the things that they've been doing is looking at their discrete provision. Uh, and uh, my colleague Joe may talk a little bit more about that, but making sure that that's person centred and has the highest aspirations possible for those young people. So keeping things, uh, making sure that uh, we have high, high aspirations for young people at the heart of our decision making. 
making sure that this process is seamless. Now, one of the challenges, I think, for, for transformation and for implementation has been the inclusion within this uh, excellent um, uh, motive from the from Welsh Government, uh, the, the, the part of the, this logo which identifies not to 25, which has been misunderstood uh, to mean that young people can stay in education from 0 to 25, and that's their right. Uh, as we'll talk about today, that's not the case, but it is important to recognise that this covers that range. And one of the challenges that we need to face is that many services, services uh, both in health and, and particularly as we talk today in social social services, there is a transition within that peer, uh, that time period, that those ages, where uh, young people move from child children's to adult services, and that can pose all kinds of difficulties because um, the, the services available are very differently between those two in some cases and, and it's really important that we get that transition right. So something for us to be talking about over the next year or so. Um, another element of um, of the Act is about early disagreement resolution and it's a lot of the training that's been going on in the regions has been about how to have uh, effective conversations with uh, children, young people and their parents to come to agreements about how we overcome disagreements, how we can work together to meet needs rather than how we can argue with each other about uh, these issues, how we can develop a, a shared understanding of how we improve uh, the experience for, for children and young people. Um, the Act and Code have uh, also led to an ALN uh, sorry, the Act has also uh, led to an ALN code. Uh, it's a code, it's not a code of practice, so it's a mandatory code. And this is a kind of like a workbook for Alenco's and uh, Declos and for others in, in how, we, um, how we carry out a lot of our duties within uh, schools, local authorities, colleges and health boards. So uh, it's a really important uh, document. Unfortunately, it's also very, very long. Uh, it's, it's a, there's a lot of it's in, in quite legal language, so it does take a bit again your head round. But we'll be looking at a, a couple of elements of that today as we talk about um, the code and the act. Um, another of the elements is the increased in participation from young people. Social services colleagues will have well, this will not be a new idea to you. You've been working on the principle with the principles of uh, person centred practice for over probably over 12 years now. Uh, so this is, I believe, at the at the heart of what you do. Uh, and you'll be very pleased to know that that is very much at the heart of this transformation as well. Uh, and there's been all sorts of, of uh, training going on around Wales in all areas, including colleges, to make sure that we have an approach uh, that, that takes into account um, the, the, the principles of person centred practice. Um, within the Act, as well as a unified plan, not to get, uh, well, you know, not to get too carried away with this. We are, we have an individual development plan, uh, as in England they have uh, an EHC plan, an, an education, health and care plan. We have our individual development plan. But as my TL colleagues will want to reinforce, it's not about the document. It's not about the bit of paper. It is about the process. It's really important that we keep that in, in mind. And that that earlier thing about um, person-centred practice should key into that. And that should give us our way forward with how we work with young people and how we meet their needs. It's about being less adversarial. I, I don't know how much we're going to achieve around that area. We've been talking recently about uh, the potential issues around uh, around tribunals and what have you, but hopefully we can overcome that uh, by having early disagreement resolution. Uh, it's about being bilingual. And uh, obviously within Wales, um, it's a, we, we're working with a bilingual system and despite the fact I don't speak Welsh, uh, I recognise the importance of having that uh, at the centre of, of these changes and having clear rights of appeal. So uh, young children, young people and their parents have a right to appeal decisions made by local authority schools uh, and colleges and uh, the tribunal has a new set of rules around uh, to, to work around that as well. And uh, the one I've left till last, because it's in my way, my, my view today, it's the most important one, which is about partnership and collaboration. It's at the centre of these changes and so important that we're working closely together on these changes. So uh, something about definition of, of ALN, additional learning needs, uh, and this is really important to understand. Uh, a, a person has an additional learning need if he, he or she has a learning difficulty and or disability that calls for additional learning provision. So this is not everybody who sits on uh, currently within an SEN 
uh, register within a school. It's not necessarily uh, young people uh, who are on uh, school action or even school action plus. It ha uh, these young people have to meet this requirement. So if uh, within a school or a college, uh, young people's needs are being met uh, by what we're starting to call universal provision, then they would not have additional learning needs necessarily. So it's really important to understand that. And that's another one of those messages that maybe hasn't really got across to uh, to our uh, to the to the public just yet. And we've got a lot of work to do to try to make sure that's really clear. And we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Uh, colleges have been working on the universal and additional learning provision offers to make that as clear as possible. So it's really clear about which young people uh, have their needs met through universal provision and which uh, and who might need to, to have additional learning provision. Um, the IDP that I mentioned earlier uh, is a document which is outcomes focused. So it's all about understanding the outcomes for young people. It's understanding what their aspirations, goals are, what they're, where they're headed. Um, setting appropriate outcomes for them, outcomes that lead them towards independence and, and the life that they wish to lead. And making sure then that the provision that we're offering young people actually makes sense to meet the, the needs of those outcomes. It shouldn't be about where do, where's this young person got to go. The first port of call um, is about what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve for this young person before we start talking about either where this the young person goes or um, how we might uh, put what kind of additional learning provision we might need to put in place it has to start with outcomes. Start with where you're headed, as they say. Um, these are IDPs, as mentioned earlier, person centred. Um, the young person in our cases, we're working with young people. They are at the centre of the decision making process and they need to be involved in every decision uh, around around them that, that goes into that individual development plan. Uh, these are reviewed annual annually, at least annually. So we will have within colleges, we'll have annual reviews for each of these learners, something that colleges generally haven't focused on in the past. This is a new duty for colleges, uh, as is the IDP. Um, and it's really important time. Those reviews are, are really important that they're person centred and that they give uh, both children, young people and their parents an opportunity to raise issues and an opportunity for us to overcome any concerns or issues that they may have. And these will be maintained either by an LA school or FEI. And for post 16, uh, for those young people in a further education institute, they, they could still be maintained by an LA if the college feels that it's unreasonable for the uh, college to either assess the needs for additional learning provision or to provide that additional learning provision. And there's lots of conversations going to be had over the next year about what that really means. What things will colleges be doing? What could we reasonably be expected to do? And what things do we need to turn to our local authorities to support or to provide? Um, so something about the people involved in this process, if you didn't know, or know this already. So Elenco has been a term that's been used for some time, but this is really important to understand that the role of the Elenco is completely different to the role of the Senco uh, under the last set of legislation. This is a, a strategic role and these uh, these people have an absolutely key role in making sure that the organisation understands its responsibilities. They set policy, they influence policy, and uh, they need to be involved uh, with the senior leadership teams in order to make sure that the colleges and schools are working in an appropriate way. Our DECLOs are all in post now. We have four DECLOs around uh, around the, the country, and uh, these are uh, this stands for Designated Education Clinical Lead Officer. They work for the uh, seven local authorities, sorry, the seven health boards and are there as the kind of coordinator of, of health provision for education. And that's, that's going to take a real challenge, I think, to, to work out how we're going to work with, with uh, our health colleagues. We're doing some work in post-16 at the moment, looking at how we can start to get a shared understanding of what that might look like. So a lot of work um, starting to go on around that. And then we have our uh, colleagues, early years, additional learning needs lead officers that work for the local authority within each of the local authorities and focus on that period of time. 
Um, transformation has been going on now for three years. Uh, hard to believe. Um, uh, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I cover Wales from an FEI perspective. I have colleagues uh, in, in each of the consortia then that I've been working uh, in some cases for three years, in some cases a little bit less, uh, on ensuring that tr uh, transformation is effective with each of those regions. And uh, if you haven't already come across these young people, uh, these uh, these people, uh, these TLs, transformation leads, it's really I hope very much that you will uh, will be engaging with them in the future. It's really important that we get full engagement in each of the regions. Um, something uh, briefly about um, about timelines. Um, there are some there's un some uncertainties at the moment about some of these things, but we know that um, in terms of uh, compulsory education, that the school year cohorts within the uh, within the first year, starting from September this year, uh, what are the nursery years one and two and the school years one, three, five, seven and ten. Um, and uh, as from that point on, we're still really in, in conversations with Welsh Government. The Welsh Government are looking at the implementation plan uh, on, for the long term. The, uh, the guidance of, for the first year of implementation has not been released yet. We're hoping that's going to be out in a couple of weeks time. Uh, but the, they're, they're trying to make sure that the wording of that is as helpful as possible. Uh, and then in terms of where post-16 comes into this, well, that's yet to be decided. It could be uh, that that starts in September 2022, but there are some additional legal problems in how Welsh Government define the way in which um, that, that uh, actually uh, manifests itself within impl the implementation plan. So they're still working on that and I'm working closely with them on it. Uh, and then the final year of um, uh, of uh, of transfer of implementation, I should say, the 23-24 year, uh, we we think that's likely. I've put a question mark there because we think it's likely when the uh, specialist uh, post-16 uh, institution budget uh, is delegated to local authorities for entrance going into that year. We haven't had that confirmed yet from Welsh Government, but that's when we believe that might happen. And by July 2024, uh, the, the hope is, uh, the plan is that all young people will come under the new system. Uh, so something about the ALN code, uh, it's a, a heavy document. Uh, it provides uh, the mandatory guidance, as I've said, for, uh, for, uh, for various partners and stakeholders. Uh, it's supported by a number of regulations, uh, which are all available on the, on the website, on the, the Welsh Government website. It's filled with uh, with uh, 33 fairly long chapters. This is not light bedtime reading, I can tell you. I'm going to talk to you today uh, particularly about chapter 16 and 17, um, because the 16 is, is I'll, I'll say just briefly about 16, 16 covers further education institutes. So if you're looking for the information pertaining to them and how they will work with uh, local authorities, then that uh, that is the chapter that you, you should be headed for. Um, and if not, if, uh, but, but if, if a young person is not in a school or a a, um, or an FEI, then uh, chapter 17 kicks in. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today uh, because there's some, again, a bit of misunderstanding going on around chapter 17. So I thought I'd use today as an opportunity to talk through a little bit about that. So uh, apologies for the amount of text on the screen, but I've, I've had quite a long conversation with Welsh Government in trying to make sure that the, the text that I use for this is not going to contravene any legal or other uh, issue that, that's going on. So uh, first, the first thing to say as you're looking at this text, I'm not going to read it out to you, but as, as you're looking through this text, the first thing to say is there is no change in terms of the um, the experience that young people should have around uh, the amount of time they might have in further education, post-16, post-compulsory education. There, there, is no, um, there is no law that exists at the moment that gives people the right, young people, the right to have more than two years uh, post-16 education. And neither will there be in the new legislation either. That hasn't changed. So there's no significant change. The difference is that the arrangements for young people who uh, are not in a college or not in a school will move to our uh, uh, to local authorities and they will have to make that decision currently welsh government the welsh minister has a discretionary power how they undertake um, this 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 duty and uh, whether they undertake uh, what are called s140 assessments that's the learning and skills plan that careers wales pro uh, provide or work on and, and develop 
and uh, uh, you know that that discretionary power then will move to local authorities who will then have to make a judgment about whether a young person uh, perhaps a young person uh, who has not yet had two years entitlement or a young person who has already perhaps spent two years in a in a, a sixth form or in a special school post 16 whether they ha still have a reasonable need for uh, for for um, education and or training now what is most important here is that we don't have a situation where uh, young people experience something worse than they experience now. It's really important we don't do that because this is supposed to be, this legislation is supposed to be improving the experience for children and young people and families. So we can't have a situation where we suddenly start turning off opportunities for young people. But it is about making sure that we are uh, we are outcomes focused. We're looking at what outcomes those young people need and that we are uh, ensuring that they have the, uh, a fair opportunity, both under the ALN Act and the um, the uh, Equality Act, uh, a fair opportunity to achieve their, their goals and outcomes. So, um, so, no, so no changes really is, is the thing to say in terms of this, but it is important that local authorities understand this duty and understand the implications of that duty. And I think uh, as, as TLs and, and myself, we'll be obviously working with local authorities over the next uh, year, uh, certainly over the next eight months that we're in post to make sure that um, that we you know they've had every opportunity to really think through those things and we'll look at some potentially other uh, events that we can put on to to discuss discuss those items one of the things to think about in in terms of this process is transition um, i've said in many many meetings if we get the transition right for young people then everything else can follow and transition involves everybody it, it involves certainly our social service colleagues uh, it involves uh, health in some instances it involves certainly local authority schools colleges and others our other colleagues so it's really important both in terms of transition to the new system and in terms of the transition for young people as they move from school to post 16 post compulsory education whether that's in schools colleges specialist institutions or other providers such as training organisations, it's really important that we support that in as effective way as possible. And um, I'm going to kind of finish up really with what I see as uh, ALN heaven uh, from my point of view. Um, and what ALN heaven for me includes is the following. So one, that children are supported throughout their education to become confident, independent young people. And I'd like to emphasize the importance of that independence. We need to make sure that our young people are being encouraged to develop independence throughout their education, not just post 16, but in preparation for that post 16 as well. And there's a lot that I could say about that, but I'll, I'll leave that point there at the moment. Uh, number two is that schools, inclusion services, children's and adult services, health, FEIs and others, other post-16 providers, that we work in partnership to support young people through their transition. So that's a, another key um, ingredient of our AL in heaven. Three, uh, the discussions with children start in year nine. In almost all cases, we need to be starting those those uh, discussions with young people, with children and, and their parents about what's going to happen post 16, what, what's going to happen before that, what's going to happen post 16, so that they have an opportunity to be supported by the relevant professionals about understanding exactly what that means and in helping them to make decisions around that. It's so important to start that conversation early. Number four is is making sure that they've got high quality careers advice. So not just advice from health and social services and education, but for, but uh, health, but um, advice that's around careers and the opportunities, the wide variety of opportunities that are open to them, not just FE, uh, FEIs, but other opportunities as well. Um, and that that is going on throughout the last three years of compulsory education, that, that those conversations and opportunities for that high quality careers advice and guidance is there throughout that period. Uh, number five for me is that uh, local authorities and their partners work together to create a transparent and accessible model of provision so that all uh, children, young people and parents know what the system is and what is available post 16 so that there are no surprises. If we try and hide anything, 
or make less an issue of something. And then that comes out at 11.59, we'll have all sorts of challenges and problems in, uh, that, that will make the experience for that young person much more of a problem. When, when the parent decides they want something different, they weren't aware of what was, a, what was offer on offer originally. We need to under, help them to understand that. And while the, the code is very clear, about post-16 provision that the local option is the first option. It's very clear about that. If um, local authorities need to be thinking about where a young person is going to go and, and they're not currently in a school, college, uh, school or FEI, uh, that they need to look at local options first. We need to keep young people in their communities if that is possible, because the feeling from Welsh Government is that that's the best option for young people. However, they need to look at outside of that where that's not going to work. Um, and then number six for me is uh, that local authorities and health boards work with further education uh, colleges uh, and others to, uh, to, pro to, to provide, to ensure, to other, sorry, other providers, to ensure that young people experience a successful post-16 education and training. So right the way through their period of time in, uh, in post-16 education, particularly if they're in an FEI, that they are supported by the appropriate service where that's needed. And those conversations that we're going to be having with health, with social service, with others about how we make sure that that happens or continues to happen is going to be crucial along the way as well. And just something else to say, um, Oh, no, I haven't got that. Sorry. No. OK. Um, what I what I the um, pre, the the screen that hasn't come up for me that I thought I had there was just to say about the ALN part uh, the ALN Pathfinder. Uh, one of the things we've been working on over the last uh, few years is a uh, a site a website that will provide information and advice and guidance to uh, children to young people and to parents uh, and possibly professionals eventually about further education colleges, uh, further, further edu education institutes and what they provide and also something about the systems that work there. So we're trying to provide a really accessible uh, option for that. So that will again help the careers advice and guidance, but it won't take away from the fact that we need to make sure that high quality advice and guidance is included as we working forward. OK. So I'm going to stop sharing. So hopefully, uh, guys, you're back in the room. If uh, someone like Hannah can tell me if that hasn't happened. Um, hopefully we're OK there. Um, for those of you who've joined us while I've been uh, talking, uh, just a reminder, um, just a reminder that uh, if you've got any questions as you're as we're working through the presentations, any questions you'd like to ask us, uh, we will have a session at the end of the three presentations uh, where we attempt to answer those questions. Uh, please feel free to put those in the chat pane. That's the, the first priority. You can put them in Welsh if you'd like, um, but please do make sure you're putting those questions up if you've got particular questions that you'd like to ask us. Uh, I have two colleagues from, uh, the, to, from the transformation team, uh, Liz Jones and Tracy Peed with me today, as well as uh, uh, Joe Baldwin from Bridge End College and uh, Kirsten Jones from Natspec. So uh, if there's any questions you'd like to put to us, please use the chat pane to do that and we'll pick those up at the end of the three presentations. Um, OK, so uh, what I'd like to do then is uh, introduce you to uh, my colleague uh, Joe Baldwin from Bridge End College. And Joe, if I'd like to invite you to just check as hope, hopefully this will work for you. You can uh, share your screen and uh, get started. Wow, it works. That, that's that's showing great, great, Joe. I'll leave it to you now. That's great. Thanks, Chris. I'm just going to flip back to my slides and hopefully they'll stay on the screen. Um, so let me know if you can't see them, uh, but I don't use Microsoft Teams day to day, so this is a new one on me and hopefully you can hear me OK. Uh, so pronoun dag, good afternoon. My name is Joe Baldwin. I'm the assistant principal at Bridge End College um, and like others have already commented, feeling um, very underdressed this afternoon, uh, my, my day of working from home. Uh, so I put my glasses on in the hope that I look slightly more professional and can compare with Chris and his uh, suit and tie uh, this afternoon. Uh, I've got 15 minutes, so I'm going to try and speed through as quickly as I can. I tend to talk quite fast anyway, and I'm aware that we're being recorded, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to review this back and dub it down and slow down uh, just a little bit. 
But just to say before I kick off, I'm here clearly uh, from Bridge End College, um, but I would say that all of the work that has happened in the last uh, two to three years across Wales has been absolutely extraordinary. Um, and I know colleagues from other FE colleges are on the call joining me today. Um, and so just to give you a bit of context in terms of FE in Wales, so there are 13 FE colleges spread right across Wales, and you can see them on the map here, uh, which includes Adult Learning Wales. And in the last two to three years, we've seen lots of structure changes in terms of preparation for uh, the introduction of the Act in the Code this coming September. It certainly feels like it's been long awaited and we've been talking about it for a long time, so it will certainly be great to get it across uh, that sort of start line or the finish line uh, in September. So we've seen um, ALN teams and ELENCOs being introduced in colleges, so all of our um, FE colleges have got that statutory role that we see within the Code. Um, we've got ALN transformation strategies and working with um, the likes of Chris and the other transformation leads, just monitoring progress against some key outcomes within our transformation strategies as colleges right across Wales. Um, we've all done pieces of work around what the provision offer looks like in terms of universal provision and that additional learning provision that the code talks about. And I'll talk about that in some more detail as we go through the next couple of slides. And then there's certainly been extensive staff development at all levels of colleges. Um, so we've got colleagues at the moment that are doing level seven qualifications in things like autism. Uh, we've had training and support for our learning support assistance. And then we've done college development days in professional learning uh, for all staff, so business support staff and lecturing staff um, really an acknowledgement of it being everybody's responsibility to understand and to meet the needs of young people with ALN right across Wales. Most colleges um, have a learner population that goes um, in many cases from 14 because some colleges have uh, what we know as the junior apprenticeship programme, so working with young people in schools um, who are 14 to 16 years old, but predominantly 16 plus right the way uh, through to the grave, we would accept learners. And of course, we know that the Act is looking at that 0 to 25 age range, which is a real shift and a real step change for colleges in Wales, uh, because of course, colleagues will know that up until now, that SEN statement would have generally ceased um, into post 16 and there wouldn't have been a structure um, of sort of annual reviews and a, and a sort of a unified plan going into post 16. So just to give you a bit of a, an overview, because this may be something that you're sat wondering in terms of levels and what happens within colleges. So provision is vast. So anything from A levels and apprenticeships right through to things like equine, engineering, uniform public services. There is a real breadth of curriculum, both vocational and academic curriculum available um, across FE institutions. And what I've just done there is just to give you an idea in terms of chronological um, levels. So you might hear colleges talking about um, entry level one or level one, level two, level three, and wondering what that means and how that relates in terms of equivalency to schools. So the table just demonstrates there just to give you an idea that when we're talking about entry level provision, generally we're talking about um, what we now call independent living skills. So working with young people that in most cases have got additional learning support needs and they are developing independent living skills and employability skills to move on and either progress within the college or to be successful within their adult life. So you can see really pre-entry to level three would be further education. And then I've got the orange section that you can see on the slide there, which is where we tend to cross over with, with HE, with higher education, uh, where level four, five and six can also be delivered within an FE institution. And generally that's done with a partner university or a number of partner universities. Um, so in terms of our offer as a college, um, what you can see here, and this would be similar for all of the colleges in Wales, um, we've all worked hard to develop content on college websites that are accessible for professionals and for parents. So this is an example of Bridge End College website. So you can scroll down um, and then just towards the bottom of the website, there's a link that takes you into our additional learning support section. And what we've done is worked to develop a whole range of short videos um, and also some guides. There's an opportunity to meet the team, to tour facilities. Um, and I'll just take you into an example so that you can see one of these. Uh, so straight away to the right hand side, you can see that there are 360 degree virtual tours. So an opportunity for young people, for parents, for professionals to have a look at some of our facilities to try and break down those transition steps. So even before they walk through the door, they start to get a feel for what they can expect and some of the key areas of the college that they might be working within.
As I said, there are short videos that talk about some of the support available, uh, what an annual review might look like, what type of support people could expect if they attended a college. Um, and then we've also got a guide that you can download in both Welsh and English. Um, and we've got printed copies of these that we provide during annual reviews. And again, all colleges in Wales have got similar to this. Uh, so you can see it covers off some key questions that parents and carers or young people might have in terms of the support available for them uh, within a college. Um, so there's a whole range um, of information around how to tell us about support needs, our transition support, things like our skills coaches and success centres, wellbeing support is all within there. So in terms of transition, um, and I know um, Chris has touched on this already within his presentation, but all colleges have worked hard to develop what that transition offer looks like for them. And many people have got roles that would be similar to a transition lead or a transition coordinator who would go out and work with schools within the locality to attend school based annual reviews. And I guess if there's one thing that we've reflected on and we've learned in the last sort of 12 to 18 months is actually one thing that has worked well for us is some of the online um, annual reviews that we've been able to attend just in terms of efficiency, in terms of partners being able to get together and join a meeting that might be for an hour and not having to build in that travel time. So that's certainly something that we have found has been really, really effective in the last 12 to 18 months. So our transition support would look at things like course applications, would support with things like attending open events, keeping in touch days. And also we run a summer school for learners that have disclosed an ALN need so that they can come and spend some time with us uh, during the summer to tour the campus, to get to know personal tutors, to look at perhaps a visual timetable, to fill out almost like a transition passport so that they're ready to start with us in September. So personalised visits, um, liaison with parents, carers, external agencies, all of that sort of activity is happening in all colleges across Wales. In terms of um, support for learners, so we've got specific learner difficulties tutors who might support with things like access arrangements for exams, so similar to schools, things like extra time, uh, scribes, readers, that type, uh, type of thing. Uh, libraries and success centres often provide great quiet spaces for learners to be able to study and get additional learning support. Uh, we've got skills coaches that would support with things like literacy and numeracy and study skills support. Um, communication in deaf support, so where a learner might need support with British Sign Language or other types of support, we've got that within colleges. Um, and then within Bridge End College, and I know lots of other colleges have developed these roles as well, we've also got an assistive technology lead and an autism lead, and their role really is to champion um, the use of things like assistive technology to make um, learning and teaching more accessible to the learners that come and study with us. All colleges have got uh, great wellbeing support as well. They offer things like counselling and that additional wraparound to make sure that learners feel well supported during their time with us at college. In terms of wider additional learning support, um, so learning support assistants are available in a similar way to perhaps the way a teaching assistant might operate within a school. Um, and in Bridge End College, certainly our learning support assistants have, have completed a level two qualification around the skills for learning support. Um, and we've been doing some work around maximising the use of teaching assistance and looking at a scaffolding framework and also uh, low arousal approaches uh, with our learning support assistance. So really professionalising that role and the importance of that role, because of course we know it's an incredibly expensive resource, but it's also a very, very important resource. And our learning support assistance would support both groups, but also with one to one where that might be needed. So thinking about campus accessibility, medication handling, staff that are trained with things like manual handling, personal care, the administration of, of, of medication, all of that sort of stuff happens naturally within colleges across Wales. In terms of independent living skills, so just to give you an idea of, of a curriculum area that exists again in all colleges um, across Wales. So our independent living skills curriculum is generally built around what we call the four pillars. Uh, so that focuses on health and wellbeing, community, um, inclusion, independent living and employability and lots of independent living skills provision now um, is, is looking at RAPA frameworks which stands for um, recognising and recording um, progression and achievement and also non-accredited le learning pathways so really giving time and space to look at those person-centred objectives and outcomes and work into structure and build a programme that's meaningful for an individual that isn't reliant on a qualification but instead focuses on developing those key vocational and practical skills to be successful and to be able to progress. 
So I've already touched on um, in-class support. I've already touched on things like enrichment and practical experiences. And you can see some photos there of things like travel training uh, that we would support learners with, work experience opportunities, and also connecting with employers in other community-based organisations to really enrich that experience. Um, supported internships, so a number of colleges um, and colleagues that are present today are running supported internship programmes. It's a really, really fantastic opportunity for young people with additional learning support needs to spend time in a, a fully immersive environment. So you would have a host business. So our example as a college is working with the Princess of Wales Hospital in Bridgend. Um, and you can see there um, Aline and Morgan and our group of interns uh, that started in the first year with us. So they would spend um, all of their week, Monday to Friday, within the hospital environment. We've got a base room um, that they would go to in the morning, they would start to prepare for the day, they would start to think about what is planned for the day, they would wear the uniform for the department that they would be working in, they go through a full health and safety induction and an organisational um, induction, so you can see them all with their lanyards there. And across the academic year, they do three internship rotations, so they identify through job profiling, things that they're interested in, in destinations or job roles that they might like to do um, when they leave the programme. And then through a layering approach, they would rotate on three internships, starting to build the skills and acquire the knowledge that they need to be successful within that job role. Uh, within that model, we have a tutor and a job coach who are permanently based within the host business, so within the Princess of Wales, to support interns and also support departments to make sure the, the, the placements and the internships are successful. And as part of that, they would undergo travel training as well to make sure that they can get to work, that they can be on time, um, and that they know where they need to be when throughout the day. And we've seen some fantastic success with supported internship programmes with learners going on, not just within the Princess of Wales Hospital, but with other employers as well to gain meaningful paid employment and to be successful in life. And I'm just gonna play you a very, very short video just to give you a bit of a flavour of what the programme looks like. This partnership has been everything and more for our interns. To see them develop over the last year has been simply incredible. It's just been wonderful to see the confidence grow in uh, and the support that we've been able to give. It's been a privilege being involved in Project Search and seeing the amazing impact that it's had on these people's lives. We have learned that we can support somebody with a learning disability. How we can adapt training and then make that training suit the person that we're trying to train. I think the placement has been really excellent because I work in a really friendly and safe working environment as well as having great relationships with my colleagues and my managers. My I'm sitting there. I was a bit nervous when I first started, but as the weeks progressed, uh, my confidence grew and I was able to work better. He's just grown into the role and he's, he seems so much more confident in himself. The change that I've seen in every intern, they're just unrecognisable. It's changed my life because it's helped me forge the skills. I need. We've all, I think, enjoyed working with Olivia, seeing her commitment and to do the best that she can. Once I finished the course now, I would know what skills I would need. Uh, speaking as a parent, it's been really wonderful when my son comes home and he's had some positive feedback from other people. He's just so proud. I think I've progressed really well, especially on my confidence. Proudest moment, I think, has been my independence. For example, um, the travel training. So I've been able to use that to meet up with my friends. Well, before I used to have someone drive me, but then I grew more mature and confident enough to catch a bus by myself. We look forward to building on the success of this programme. And we can't thank our partners enough for their commitment to it, to help our interns to be all that they can be. Thank you. I'm sure you'll agree it's uh, certainly a, a goosebump, uh, goosebump moment and every time I see that uh, video I feel incredibly proud um, of the interns and the opportunity that it affords them. 
So quite unique to Bridge End College, um, and I couldn't do justice to introducing Kirsten next without talking about Western House, but certainly very, very unique to us is um, a 32 bed residential provision that we offer, uh, which is unique within a general FE context. So regulated and inspected by the Care Inspector at Wales, but Western House offers a 24 hour immersive curriculum to respond to learners that have got higher level additional learning needs. And this starts to fall into specialist uh, type placements that Chris has already touched on and I know Kirsten is going to talk about later. So our model within Western House is looking from Sunday evening to, to a Friday afternoon and that means that our students still get to retain that family and friend relationships and to contextualise their skills that they're learning within their home environment. So some of that as I said is residential, some of it is also available as, as day provision as well but there are great opportunities for learners to come and develop skill and I think where this really comes into its own is where uh, local authorities and where perhaps social care commissioners can think creatively around how you can work with specialist provision and also your general local um, sort of further education college to think about how you could join uh, commission certain elements of, of, of provision uh, between both a, a general further education college and also specialist provision as well. So you can see our training flats there so we've got two training flats that are fully kitted out um, sort of high spec uh, rise and fall kitchens, fully accessible bedrooms, and it really gives that that first hand real experience for learners to develop and to be able to progress. Um, Chris, your slide might have dropped into my slide deck because I was going to talk about the ALM Pathfinder as well. So Chris touched on this. You can see the web address there, almpathfinder.wales. There's lots of content that's still being delivered, so there will be an interactive map that you'll be able to see, uh, the map that I showed right at the start of my presentation so that you can explore colleges and the provision uh, available within those colleges. Um, and all of the colleges that are listed on the map, you can click through into their ALM section on their website to have a look at exactly what they do and what they're offering. Is. So the audience for the Pathfinder website is young people, parents and carers and professionals. There are three different sections that you can see on the screen and there are a number of great short videos that talk about a number of topics that relate to the ALN code and life within a further education college. Um, there's a jargon buster there and you can search sort of alph alphabetically throughout um, a range of different terms and acronyms. Um, so it's a great resource and I'd encourage you to have a look at it and I'm going to stop there and hand back to Chris. That's absolutely fantastic, Joe. Uh, I agree with some of the comments that have been coming through. Excellent video. Um, I have to say I'm, I've am i been a staunch supporter of supported internships uh, for the last 25 years, possibly, since I worked with a chap called Alan Morgan in uh, based in Blackwood with the Pathway Employment Office there. Absolutely fantastic way of getting young people who would struggle otherwise into employment. And I think it's something that colleges and others over the next year are going to be focusing particularly on, particularly with the uh, current climate we're going to be moving into post COVID. So thank you so much for that. That's really helpful um, and a great presentation from you. I'm going to introduce you now to uh, colleague, uh, a colleague, uh, Kirsten Jones from NatSpec. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for joining us today. Can I just check, Kirsten, are you going to have a go at sharing yourself or do you want me to put it up? I'm going to have a go at sharing, Chris, if that's right. okay. So give me a shout if you have a problem, but I, I'll hand you over now to Kirsten, Kirsten Jones from uh, NatSpec Wales. Thank you, thank Kirsten. Thank you, Chris. Prinham Dharma, everybody. Um, apologies that my presentation isn't bilingual. And yeah, just to say, and also everybody else is saying about Joe's video, it's just fantastic to see and um, reminds us all of what this is all about. So, as you know, my name's Kirsten Jones. I'm a policy officer at NAPSPEC. We're the membership body for specialist FE colleges. And we also provide training and CPD across the FE sector for FE colleges, sixth form colleges, and other providers through our transform and tech ability training services. I really welcome the opportunity to be involved in this afternoon's event, as well as the opportunities that ALN Transformation brings for us all to work together to improve outcomes for young people in Wales with complex needs. So along with those opportunities, Welsh Government through the ALN Code have given us all some quite fundamental challenges to grapple. And I'm hoping today we can identify some of our common challenges and some of the difficult questions that they bring. While both specialist colleges and FEIs provide programmes of learning designed to enable students with ALN to make a positive progression from college, specialist colleges tend to work with students who need more specialist input, including multidisciplinary support and expertise. 
These include students with more complex, low incidence, high needs, which cannot easily be resourced in an FEI. And those who would struggle in a busy FEI environment, for example, because of behaviours that challenge or because of the nature of their social, emotional and mental health needs. So in relation to ALN transformation, specialist college placements are located in what is something of a grey area when a regional FEI is not an option for a young person with complex ALN. The grey area being the decision making on whether or not that young person should move from special schools straight into social care provision or the option of a specialist placement explored. And Chris has already um, talked about that and how that discretionary judgments will be moving to local authorities. So in talking to Chris about today, we both thought it might be useful if I shared with you a couple of snapshot case studies of young people who have been at specialist colleges in Wales. So I'm going to go for the screen share and see if I can do that. OK, start, starting by talking to you about Jack. Jack is from a neat background following the breakdown of his mainstream school placement. Jack has autism and psychosis. He struggled with interacting with others and hence forming friendships was particularly difficult. He also experienced regular anxiety related behavioural outbursts. Managing change and unpredictable situations was difficult. He joined a specialist FE college as a day student and he wanted to improve his life skills, particularly his communication and independence skills. Ultimately, Jack wants a job and a two year placement was agreed with Welsh Government. When he joined the college, a comprehensive baseline assessment by a multidisciplinary team focused on how Jack's aspirations could be achieved. With high intensity specialist therapeutic support integral to his programme, Jack was supported to develop coping skills, for example, when he was experiencing hallucinations, and Jack played a central role in his own positive behaviour support planning. Jack was supported to understand his own strengths and to set achievable goals. The tailored individual learning programme with focused outcomes meant that Jack's progress could be continually monitored and reviewed. An autism friendly environment providing clear structure and routine supported Jack to build trust in relationships with staff who in turn supported Jack in forming friendship with peers. Through this destination led curriculum, Jack was able to practice the development of his core skills and to transfer those skills to the wider community. Jack's outcomes. Nearing the end of his programme, Jack has significantly improved mental health and well-being and has a range of coping skills he is able to implement independently. Jack has a better understanding of his autism and he can now self-regulate and manage hostile feelings. Jack and stakeholders agree that Jack has the potential to live semi-independently. Jack's increased core skills means that he is now able to access the wider community with increased confidence. Stakeholders also agree that Jack has the potential for both voluntary and paid full time employment. That's Jack. I'll now tell you about Ben. Ben's needs are much more complex. He too has autism. He also has epilepsy and severe learning disabilities. I'm highlighting Ben's story as I think his journey exemplifies how a specialist FE placement can prepare young people with very complex needs for their post college adult lives outside the parameters of vocational skills and employability outcomes. So Ben is largely non-verbal and found it very difficult to be with people he did not know and trust. His challenging behaviour was manifested in pulling the hair of nearby people, whether they be staff, peers, family or strangers in the wider community. He would also self-harm when distressed. Ben self-regulated by using an iPad and would become physically destructive when prohibited from accessing it. Ben joined the college as a residential student on a 52 week placement. Stakeholders agree that post college Ben will live in a supported living residential environment with other young people with complex needs. So again, a focused MDT approach, including clinical psychology, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, total communication and experienced teaching and support staff agreed Ben's individual learning programme to ensure the desired outcomes on developing Ben's independent living skills could be met. Short term targets were plotted against Ben's longer term destination aim of supported residential living. 
Ben's targets and behaviour support plan were shared across his residential and day college environments. The college's total communication framework provided Ben with increased opportunities to both understand what was being asked of him and for others to understand him. For example, resources including talking mats were used to support Ben in explaining what made him anxious and in turn he was supported with strategies to manage that anxiety. For example, how to use signs or symbols to tell staff when he needed some space. So some examples of Ben's targets included expressing choices around well-being and needs, contributing to household routines and carrying out simple steps independently, and increasing coping skills and decreasing his reliance on his iPad. So how did the placement improve Ben's life chances? Ben's barriers to accessing the wider community have significantly reduced. He is now accessing the local town with increased confidence and behavioural incidents are rare. Ben's wellbeing and independent skills are all much improved. His reliance on staff is reduced. Using total communication resources, Ben is able to self-advocate, make informed choices, and he can now verbalise keywords. Ben is also better able to manage his own leisure time his increased ability to self-regulate means he is much less reliant on his iPad and responds without incident when it's time to put it aside. Ben is increasingly able to engage in and enjoy social activities with peers. He has increased empathy and the ability to live alongside others. Throughout his placement, Ben's family have maintained consistent contact and he's returned to his parental home for weekend visits and during key holiday times. His family have been delighted with the progress that Ben has made during his placement and now have increased confidence in him being able to manage the demands of adulthood. His mum has been able to return to full-time employment and the overall stress and anxiety the family feel about Ben's future has reduced. Following this holistic residential living and learning experience, all stakeholders are positive about Ben's ability to manage a post-college environment if shared living with other young people. A well-planned transition will ensure that staff in his new residential house understand Ben's preferences, abilities and triggers and how Ben has been supported to manage the demands of daily living. So I hope that those two snapshots have been useful to highlight the unique role specialist colleges play for unique young people. Importantly, the key message is that that an FEI cannot meet a young person's needs for education and training does not mean that those needs are unmeetable. You will be aware that the ALN code leaves considerable, considerable ambiguity in its use of the term a reasonable need for education and training and when to cease and when to maintain an IDP for a young person not an FEI. I'm very keen to work with you to develop a shared understanding in response to those difficult questions. We want to work with you to ensure that young people whose education and training needs require a specialist placement are not disadvantaged by their additional learning provision needs in comparison to their more able peers. These are Wales's specialist colleges, all of whom are keen to work with you on a regional and national basis to understand your needs and how they may need to adapt to meet them. NatSpec is keen to play a role, any role it can in facilitating those discussions. Thank you for listening. That's my contact details. Thank you, Kirsten. That's absolutely great. Thank you very much, really helpful. Are you able to stop sharing? That's Thank great, you. fantastic, okay. Thank you, Kirsten. Thanks for that. Um, and, you know, just to kind of add to that, all the way through this process, uh, my view has been uh, there will always be uh, young pe people for whom uh, a further education institute, you know, the normal day uh, provision provided by uh, colleges in Wales, it, it's just we're not the right environment, not for every young person. We have done some work over the last uh, two or three years to develop our skills and to be get, become better at what we do for young people with who have uh, additional learning needs, but we're never going to be, be able to meet all needs. Uh, so it's really important to get a picture of the whole uh, the whole 
provision that's available across Wales. And obviously the, the ISPs, the specialist colleges, uh, have their role to play in that. And I know that they're very eager, uh, working with NatSpec and yourselves, to kind of investigate uh, various options, um, uh, you know, that, that, that to, in order to make sure that young people's needs are met. So thanks again for that, uh, Kirsten. That's great. Now, uh, I've been keeping a, an eye on uh, the the chat uh, there, and we've had a couple of questions come through, but both of them have really pretty much been answered. I'll just uh, point in, but I, I need you now, if, if you have got any particular questions, please make sure you do put them in the chat now. Uh, otherwise, we get, we'll actually, uh, we'll be ending early, which is fine, but uh, might not, not need, meet uh, all the needs uh, that you've come come to this event with today. So really important if you've got questions to get them in the chat pane now. Um, Joe, if you haven't seen, Joe has answered a couple of questions in there, both about the um, the, the supported internships uh, that uh, he offers. Uh, and uh, he's mentioned there uh, in the first year, seven out of the nine young people that were involved in that uh, moved into uh, employment as a result of that. So really, really positive uh, kind of outcomes, despite some of the issues going on. Uh, also, there was a question about uh, Western House that he runs, and uh, he's put in a link there, um, if anybody wants that link uh, to that particular um, uh, question, really. And if you're interested in finding more about that, you can use that link. Uh, and I'll probably include that as well in the after uh, after event pack as it comes out. So uh, time to ask any questions that you've got, uh, if you have got any questions. Otherwise, as I say, it's early bath for everybody, uh, which I know it's Friday afternoon and often that's the case. But uh, please do uh, ask questions away if you've got any. Nothing coming through at the moment. So if you are unable to use the chat and you would like to ask a question verbally, just uh, unmute your mic and, and feel free to do that. I can't believe that our explanations have been so amazing this, this afternoon that there isn't a single question, but if that's the case, that's fine. OK. OK, so I, I'm, I, there's no point in um, holding on this. I can't see anybody's typing into the chat pane at the moment. I'm assuming uh, either everybody's gone to sleep or everybody's had their questions answered. Uh, there will be um, a, a, a post event pack with the presentations in and uh, we'll also, if there are any extra questions that come along between now and then, we'll put something. We've got a couple of questions coming through, so oh, hang on a minute. Now we're now we're starting to. Uh, now we're starting to get them, so let me, I'll, I'll pick them out now. Hold on a second. So, OK. Uh, so do you expect to see more new initiatives coming online over the next few years with a different offer? Uh, I, I'm assuming that's that's come from Jason Bennett. Um, I'm wondering if that's coming to sort of uh, asking myself or Joe specifically. Uh, if that's a general question about new initiatives, uh, we, we have a number of initiatives that are going on around Wales at the moment anyway. So initiatives around the new curriculum, uh, the RAPA based curriculum, as well as an, uh, there's an initiative in, uh, in if you were at the partnerships, one, the first partnerships event, uh, something called Camum Line, uh, which uh, is something that's going on, a partnership between social services, uh, education and the Further Education Institute there, colleague, uh, uh, colleague Kerry Diggian, uh, and that is uh, meeting the needs of some young people with quite profound learning difficulties and disabilities. So, so that's uh, something to watch out for. Uh, if you want further information about that, it, it uh, some details about that in the post event pack from the last event we put on. So, be happy to put something in there. Um, looking to see if there's any other questions coming through. We've got some hands up, so people perhaps who haven't got access. So if I move instead to the people, see who had their hand up first. Uh, and I'll, I'll start with Joe. Do you want to come in there, Joe? Yeah, thanks, Chris. It's just to pick up on on the same sort of um, topic line, really, from Jason, um, because there is there's lots of stuff happening in, in colleges with 
various pots of money that have come from Welsh Government. So there's uh, certainly colleges at the moment that are trialling um, the use of study support mentors on apprenticeship programmes. Um, so looking at supported apprenticeship models. So that would almost be a, a step on from a supported internship and more um, geared towards apprenticeships. Um, but there are lots of examples of things happening. Chris has just touched on one and I know Kirsten's got her, her hand up because she's probably going to talk about the project that Nats Becker involved in, uh, which starts to look at some of the things I touched on in my presentation around how can FEIs and specialist colleges start to partner and work together to collaborate on provision that would meet the need of young people coming through. But I'll um, let Kirsten pick that up. Thanks, Joe. Kirsten, do you want to jump in there? Yes, thank you, Joe. You're absolutely right in that. And that's what I was going to say. And I just think that the ALN transformation offers us the real opportunity to not be led by the provider, but to be led absolutely by what that young person needs. And for some people, that might be two or three days in, in an FEI, in a general FE environment, but they still need specialist support for a discrete area of their needs. So I think that that um, the doors are really opened for that. I also think that the um, local agenda, if you like, inherent to ALN reform means that there's a real role there for existing specialist colleges who do have a lot of specialism and expertise to be reaching out to local authorities to seek to fill any gaps that they have in their regions and gaps in provision and the partnership working that that um, could bring in relation to working with FEIs too. And one more thing that I wanted to say was just about the opportunities this brings for partnership and collaboration in post-college transitions. And I think I don't need to tell anybody on the call, I'm sure, how so many young people experience a cliff edge at the end of a college placement. Um, and that the new funding mechanisms allow us to work much more creatively, collaboratively, to build really strong, sustainable transition programmes for young people and avoid those cliff edges. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. That's really helpful. Um, I've had a couple of um, comments or questions or requests actually um, in, in here. So um, from uh, Sarah Hiron, uh, information about College Care Adigian would be good. So what I'll do, because there's a couple of people that have asked about that, I'll put, I'll try to include the presentation from the last event into the after, uh, after uh, event pack that comes out. If you've registered, you will get a copy of that pack, which will also have the recording of this event, as well as the presentations that have come with it. Uh, there was a, another request for presentations as well, so that will, I'll make sure you get those. Um, and also from Catherine P uh, Packer, is it possible to have a list of the Elencos in each college and the person responsible for lack care leavers, as this would be a useful directory to have access to uh, and make sure we are making contact with the right person? So, uh, yeah, I think I, I might not include that in the after pack. I don't know. Maybe I can. I, I certainly have uh, that information. I can provide that. Um, what it would be good to do is to start to get a regional directory together. I've spoken to Health about this and maybe we need an overall ALN directory for each region that will include all of the Elencos in the colleges, all of the um, the appropriate leads for uh, therapy and in, in the health boards, as well as uh, perhaps local authority contacts, that kind of thing. So I think that's that's something that would be really helpful so that everybody has everybody's link and contact details. So that's something long term. In the short term, I can certainly provide uh, the a, link, a list of Elencos for colleges. No problem at all. Uh, OK, watching uh, to see if there's any other questions coming through. Uh, Dewis is a good place to put information, so I'm, I'm going to have to look that up, uh, Jason, because I've never come across that. I don't know what Dewis is. If I've in, in, in fact, if I've even pronounced it correctly, could be Dewis. Um, uh, Jason, would you like to unmic and just let me know what that is? Yeah, it's the national database for um, all of uh, community provision um, run by Welsh Government. So you should be able to go into Dewis and find the, all the services in your area. So thank you for that, Jason. I've... It's Claire here, Claire Lister or Higgins, as you'll have me coming up, maybe. Um, I've just got married. So um, just to come back for a second, explain that to you and I can give you the links. And I think that's probably a really good place 
um, to, to, to place some of this information that's been asked for, but um, I can link in with you after the after the session to start facilitating some of that as well. Oh, that would be absolutely fantastic, Claire. And a very uh, thank you very much for for joining us today. Um, and and having just spoken to Claire there, just as a reminder, I I'm aware that we'll have uh, colleagues from some uh, social service departments within Wales who are unable to join us today. So Claire, what I'll do with yourself and Sarah is send you a copy of the after event pack, which will have the recording on it, and perhaps then you can send that out to your me uh, members who haven't attended. What I'm I'm keen to do is is for this not to end here, but to uh, spark up some renewed conversations and uh, collaborations going uh, on regionally and locally. So uh, anything we can do to support that, anything I can do to support that, I'd be happy to do. Uh, so thanks for that, Claire, that's great. Uh, and a couple of uh, people have said, yeah, the idea of a directory is great. So we need to make sure that not only do we make sure the right people are on it, but also that it's available to all. So that's two things. Um, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for that. Jason's provided the link. Uh, OK, brilliant. Well, we, we've got uh, 14 minutes left of our event if we want to use it. Uh, if there's anybody who else wants to uh, ask a question either by unmiking or putting it in the uh, the chat, please do so. Other than uh, that, if what I'm going to start to say really is what the next steps are. Uh, and this is really where each region is working in a slightly different way. So uh, some of the regions will have a regional group that meets fairly regularly, and it's really trying to make sure that we've got um, social services departments linking into those groups and representing um, so their, their departments within those groups. It's difficult for me to give you the details of that because it's different in each region, but you will probably know some of the people in your region. And uh, if, if you're not sure, uh, your transformation lead, who, whose contact details will be in this after pack, uh, will be able to put you in the right direction. It's really making sure that you're involved in those. If you're not already involved, you're involved in those regional and local conversations. In some regions, that's split into sub regions, but uh, what, however the organisation is, it's really important to get involved. Um, in particular, some of you may have already had either been involved yourself or had uh, colleagues involved in the transition protocol development or transition guidance development. So important we get the, that right and we promote that within each of the regions and then that we actually enact it, that we make sure that we are uh, enabling people to attend uh, transition reviews wherever possible, to carry out the activities and to support children and young people as they transition post-16. So, uh, you know, the, the next steps really are to get uh, as active as possible local and to make sure that your services are are, are going to uh, going to, to be to be able to interact and work with uh, the education and health services working on ALN uh, protocols and ALN activities and projects within your area. So uh, please keep an eye on that. If you've got any further questions, hopefully you'll all have my contact details as well. They'll be on the after after event pack as well. If you've got any questions uh, that come up after this or anything else that you'd like me to, to do, uh, if you feel that there is an additional event that would be helpful that you would like me to organise, I'm happy to consider that. Uh, more than anything, we want to make sure that this transformation is a transformation. It's not just a subtle change from one system to another, that the, that the young people, children and young people and parents actually experience that transformation themselves, that they recognise the improvements that are, uh, that come about by the work that we're all trying, that we're all working towards. Um, so uh, I can't see another question coming out. Um, uh, just a comment, lots of joint working at the moment, especially with ALN. Uh, that's come from Jason Bennett. Great, glad to hear it, Jason. That's fantastic. Um, I think really all I'm going to say is a big thank you to uh, to Joe and to Kirsten. Thanks to Hannah for helping me uh, set this up and organise this. Um, what I will do uh, is uh, again, you'll receive in the next couple of weeks. It'll take us a little while just to put it together. In the next couple of weeks, you'll have the after event pack with the information. Um, big thanks to my colleagues who have uh, had a, an easier afternoon than they had a morning, I can tell you. Uh, so thank you to Tracy and Liz. Thanks very much for attending. Uh, if there's anything else you wanted to comment on, Tracy and Liz, now is your opportunity. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll wind things up and um, we will, uh, we, you know, we'll, we'll see you at another time. I'm just checking the chat again just to make sure nothing else has come through. Uh, 
Um, so Kirsten's put her details in there as well. Thank you, Kirsten. Otherwise, I think we will uh, bring this to an end. Uh, have a, an excellent weekend. Uh, stay safe, everybody. Uh, enjoy whatever activities you're going to be getting on, on with. I uh, hope to see you again in the future. Uh, thank you very much for attending and uh, goodbye. Good afternoon.